Well, my name is Joshua. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm going to be preaching on the passage that was read earlier, James chapter 5, 7 through 11. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. Um, and as we've already mentioned um, today, we, we are celebrating the season of Advent. If you've never heard of that before, then um, Advent is the season before Christmas, the four weeks before Christmas, where we celebrate the coming of the Messiah. And during Advent... Um, We anticipate the coming Messiah, which means that the season of Advent is, uh, as Emily just shared, a season of waiting. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait. And I don't think that we are a culture that likes to wait for anything. You know, we say that patience is a virtue, but I think if we actually believe that, we would probably say, well... It may be a virtue, but it's not one that I actually need. It's not one that I actually need at least to be successful and wealthy and powerful. In fact, um, it's not a virtue that I need to be like an industry, a titan of industry, or especially in the tech industry. Um, I don't need patience. Do you guys remember the motto of Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook? His motto was not patience is a virtue. His motto was, go fast and break things. And we like that. Because when they go fast and break things, we get to the finish line sooner. We get our stuff sooner. Um, We like them to make the apps that bring anything we want to us within 48 hours. And we complain when it takes longer. Um, In fact, I was in Seattle... um, a couple years ago because my brother lives there and I was staying with him and as you know Seattle is the home of Amazon so I was staying in my brother's basement sleeping on an air mattress and at about 2 a.m. I wake up and the air mattress is deflated in the middle of the night and um, because I'm a modern man I turned to my phone and I looked up an air mattress on Amazon and I chose same day delivery was not even Amazon Prime, two-day shipping, because I was in the home of Amazon. And by 10 a.m., my mattress had arrived. <laughs> and the next night, I slept like a baby. Fully inflated air mattress. And, uh, and you know what that made me think? Why don't we all have same-day shipping? Why do I even have to wait for two days to get Amazon Prime? Um, <laughs> we are a culture apprenticed in instant gratification. I don't know if we even know that there's any other type of gratification. Uh, Why do we need patience when we can just get what we want um, when we want it? Why do we need patience when someone else can just develop an app that makes it so I don't need the patience anymore? But I wonder, how has this culture of instant gratification treated us? I don't think it's worked too well. You know, we don't want to wait for sex, and so we look around and we have a string of broken relationships and broken promises and addictions around us. We don't want to wait for money, and so we look around and we have credit cards maxed out in debt to get us the things we want without waiting for them. And I can't seem to wait for a cup of coffee without looking at my phone in the the few minutes it takes to get it. And some of you, once you heard me talking about looking at my phone, are now wondering if you can wait to the end of the sermon to look at yours. Uh, we don't like to wait. And, and now, in the season of COVID, we're being forced to wait. Isn't that part of what makes this season so difficult? We're waiting for all the good things to come back and for all the bad things to leave, and we don't even know when it's going to end. And there's more waiting ahead of us, which means we need more patience. And even before COVID, I know you were waiting for other things. You were waiting for friendships and careers and relationships and children. And, and you were waiting. So what are you waiting for today? What are you waiting for more than just the end of COVID? Well, in our waiting, as people who don't like to wait, but are forced to wait, the book of James tells us to be patient. So can you hear him today? Can you hear the Spirit of God telling you, be patient? Be patient, James says, like the farmer who is patient. 
Now, we may see that illustration and think, well, um, it's another way of saying good things come to those who wait. The farmer um, sows the seed and waits for the fruit. And that's a, a true enough illustration. But it's not exactly what James is saying here. Look, look there in, in, your, uh, in this passage of verse 7. The farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. See, the farmer is waiting for the rain. What does that mean? Well, in Palestine, there was a, an autumn rain and a spring rain. And James is saying, be like the farmer who's in between the two rains. He's seen it rain once, and he's waiting for it to rain again. And right now, he's in the dry season with blue skies and dry ground, and yet he knows that there's another season coming, another rain before the harvest. And we live between two rains, too, as Christians awaiting the Messiah. We live between the first coming of Jesus, the life, death, and resurrection, and ascension of Jesus that accomplished our salvation and dealt with our sins. And yet we're waiting for another rain to come. We're waiting for Jesus to return on the day in which he will deal with sin fully and finally and bring his kingdom. We're in the dry season between the tomb and the trumpet between the ascension when Jesus ascended up to heaven and when he will descend with the new Jerusalem to earth. We're in that dry season like the farmer. And James says, be patient. This is what Advent teaches us. Uh, it's, it's, it's reminding us of what is true all year round. That you and I and James and all the apostles and all the saints and the Christians who've ever lived between then and now, um, we're waiting for Jesus to return. We're waiting for the Messiah. And James says, be patient, because the Messiah is coming. He's coming again. And so we're going to look at three attitudes, three hearts that are evident here in this passage that will teach us how to wait with patience. First is the impatient heart, the heart of impatience, the, the heart of patience, and then the heart of God. Well, you might say, if you hear James saying, be patient because Jesus is coming back, you might say, well, what does my patience actually matter? If he's coming back, it doesn't matter if I'm patient or not, right? Well, how, how does, um, how, why is patience required for this? Well, I think what we have to actually see is, is the destruction of the opposite. We have to see the problem with impatience. And here's what James tells us. He says that the impatient heart is either tempted one of two ways. The impatient heart is tempted to either give in or to give up. See, if you look at uh, verse 7, it says, therefore, brothers, which means that it's referring to something that, that came before that. And if you look at the first six verses, what you'll see is that James is proclaiming a rebuke and a warning to the rich. And it's, the, it's a scathing example um, or a scathing rebuke and warning to the wealthy, and because it's especially to the wealthy who have exploited other people. They've exploited even Christians that James is writing to, and they've done it by, by holding back wages and paying low wages to their workers. Meanwhile, they're getting fat off the backs of the poor. And James is writing to them, uh, who are, he says, living in luxury and comfort and giving in to every appetite, and indulgence. See, their impatience led them to give in, to give in to the indulgence, to exploit the worker, to go fast and break things so that they could have their comfort at the expense of their workers. And that's what James is reminding us of, is if we don't have patience, then we too will be tempted to give in to our appetites and actually to tyrannize others and to claw our way past others in search of our own comfort. But then he turns to the Christians who are being exploited, the brothers that he calls them, and he warns them of the opposite temptation. That's the temptation to give up, the temptation to stop waiting at all, to throw in the towel, to think, what good is Jesus if he's not getting me out of my suffering? Do either of those sound familiar to you? They sound familiar to me, giving in or giving up. But then he adds this, this, this um, extra warning in verse 9. Lest you don't find yourself um, 
in the company of those who give up, or sorry, who give in. If you don't think, well, I'm not, I'm one who doesn't, I've never exploited anybody. I've never exploited my workers or held back any wages. He then tells us this in verse 9. He warns us against grumbling. He says, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. What's he saying? He's saying that the impatient heart doesn't just destroy you and make you miserable. It actually can make everyone else around you miserable as well. Uh, My family can probably attest to this. See, you don't need wealth and power to tyrannize the people around you. All you need is an impatient heart. And you will tyrannize the people around you. You will grumble against them. And your impatience will destroy community. Um, A couple of years ago, I went to um, the now defunct Wildwood Kitchen on Father's Day on Haley uh, Street. And uh, we went in for brunch. We went in to check on our table, check in for our table. We had reservations at 1 p.m. And guess who was sitting at Wildwood Kitchen eating with his family for Father's Day? Mark Zuckerberg, Mr. Go Fast and Break Things. And um, I'm not saying they gave him my table, but I will say that I had to wait an hour until I was seated, and it was after he was gone. But as I watched him getting into his car after he ate his meal, I saw him struggling with the car seat to get his daughter into the car seat, and fiddling with it. And, um, and I tell you that not to tell you that Mark Zuckerberg is a bad guy. Uh, God knows that my patience has run thin with many a car seat uh, in my days. But I tell you this because here's my point. Um, you can be Mark Zuckerberg. You can have all the money, the power that you want, and yet you still have to wait. There are still things beyond your control. There are still things that come into your path that force you to wait. Even if you're given in, even if you're satisfying your indulgences, you will come to, to a place where you have to wait, where you don't get what you want. And that's what is at the heart of impatience. It's being out of control, having to wait for some other circumstance, circumstance beyond yourself to get what you want. You still have to wait at red lights and coffee lines and car seats and a million other things. Um, and so we need, we need patience. Um, because at the heart of impatience is a desire to be God, the desire to control everything else. So how do we get it? How do we move from a heart of impatience to a heart of patience? Well, I'll tell you how we think we get patience. We think we get patience by saying, I'm going to be more patient. Or maybe if you're a Christian, you think, God, please give me patience with my children, with my coworkers, with COVID. And we expect that it will just fall out of the sky and we won't get angry anymore. We won't feel the need to control and we'll be patient. But it doesn't work, does it? Um, Look at what verse 8 tells us. It says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts. Establish or strengthen or set your hearts. See, James is saying if you want to be patient, then we've got to deal not just with your, not with your circumstances, but we've got to deal with with your heart. If you want to deal with the anger and the indulgence and the lack of self-control and the cynicism and the despair, you've got to deal with your heart, which means, among other things, that patience has to be learned. It has to be cultivated. Did you notice that he gives us three examples? He shows us the example of the farmer, which we've talked about, and then he shows us the example of the prophet's And then he shows us the example of Job. Where else in scripture do we get three illustrations, three examples to look at? James must be telling us that if we want to be patient, we've got, if we want to be patient, we've got to learn it. We've got to cultivate it. And we've got to, it's got to begin in our hearts. So how do we learn? Well, each of those examples 
I think, are distinct examples. But one of the things that they all three have in common, the farmer, the prophet, and the job, none of them are in control. They are all at the mercy of a sovereign God. And so however else we may learn to cultivate patience, it begins with an acknowledgement that God is God and I am not. But it's actually deeper than that because they didn't just acknowledge that God was God. Each of these examples deals with someone who knows they're not God and relinquishes control to God and hopes in his sovereignty. In other words, this is the heart of patience. This is where we begin. It's a joyful confidence in the sovereignty of God. You can't get patience without that. And if the heart of impatience is taking control for ourselves, then the heart of patience is resting in God's sovereign control of all things. He is sovereign and we are not. So here's what it looks like in part. When you're waiting for your kids to put on their shoes for the third time and you want to yell at them, hurry up, put on your shoes so we can go to church and worship Jesus. You don't do that. You whisper to yourself, I am not in control. When you're waiting in line outside of Trader Joe's on De La Vina for blocks to get in and do your grocery shopping, and you feel the impatience and the anger rising, you tell yourself, God is in control, and I am not. And he is the one who cares for me, and he will care for my needs. When you're tempted to give in to the indulgence, to break your promises, or when you're tempted to give up and throw in the towel, and you need patience, you tell yourself, the sovereign God is my strength. You establish your heart, you set your heart on the heart of God and in his sovereignty. But here's the thing about God being in control and God's sovereignty. It can be terrifying if you don't trust him. And so to set our hearts on the heart of God, we have to look at the heart of God. We have to understand his heart so that his sovereignty will be a comfort for us and we will relinquish control to him. See, for James, the whole thing hinges on the promise. This is what we set our hearts on. Verse 8, when he said, establish your hearts, he said, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. We set our hearts on the coming Christ. This is our Advent patience. We set our heart on the fact that Jesus will return and bring his kingdom with him. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. That's Advent patience. And Christ is faithful to his promises. He has come once, like we've already said, and he will come again. But what is it about his return that actually cultivates patience in us? How does the return of Christ combat our temptation to give in and to give up? Well, James tells us two things about God in this passage. Did you notice? The first is he says, the judge is at the door. When Christ comes, he will judge the nations. The rich who were tyrannizing the poor and exploiting their workers and holding back their wages They will be judged. Christ will return and judge all nations, all people. And guess what? You who grow impatient with your children, who grumble against one another, James says, repent, because the judge is at the door. And to you who are tempted to give up, who are the victims of oppression, don't give up. The judge is at the door. Christ will come to vindicate the innocent. If we, actually take, if we actually take James' advice and we consider the prophets and we look at the prophets, here's what we'll find. They prophesied of a Messiah who would come to disrupt the natural order of things. And when he came, he would bring justice on earth. Here's the Advent promise to the prophet Haggai. God said, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations. See, if you're unhappy with the the way things are, with the brokenness of this world, then take heart. The judge is at the door. He is coming 
to make things right. But if you're content with the current order of things, take stock and repent because you will be shaken when he comes. James tells us that, that we can be patient because the judge is coming. He is coming to judge and he is at the door. But that doesn't quite comfort us if we know that, that we are the impatient, that we do give in, we do give up, that we do grumble. And so then he tells us there in our passage that God is also compassionate and merciful. The judge who is standing at the door is also one who is compassionate and merciful. He says, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose or the end, the intent of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. The judge is coming to bring an end to all bad things, but he's also bringing compassion and mercy for those who love him and wait for him with patience. In the incarnation, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, these two traits of God are reconciled. The justice of God and the mercy of God. Jesus is both just and the justifier of those who fear him and love him and wait for him in patience. Which means that when he comes again, he will come with justice and with mercy and compassion for us. And like Job, we will see God. We will behold him and we will live with him forever in a new world without sin, death, or evil. A world where all the bad things have come untrue, where all the sad things have come untrue. That is the Advent promise. That's what empowers us to wait with patience. That Jesus is coming to fix all the things that are wrong with this world and he's coming to bring his mercy and compassion to those who love him and wait for him in patience. So don't give in to the luxuries of this world because another world is coming. And don't give up to despair because a better world is coming. And don't grumble with one another as you wait. Why? Because God has been patient with you. See, the heart of God is patient, slow to anger, abounding in patient love. So when you're impatient, look at the heart of God When you're with your children, your co-workers, and in that line at Trader Joe's, look at the heart of God and know that he is patient with you. He's the father that has put up with with you trying to put your shoes on so many different ways, so many different times. And yet he still waits on you. He's still patient with you. But he's not only patient with you, he's patient for you. See, why did Christ not return 2,000 years ago? The judge was at the door then. Why did he not come then? He came, he, he waited so that he could get you. You ever think about that? He waited because he had your name written in the book of life. And so when we grow impatient, Christ, how long must we wait until COVID is over? How long must we wait until my sins are over? How long must we wait until injustice and pain and suffering and evil are over? Christ says just a little longer because I've got somebody else that I'm waiting for whose name is written in the book of life. And I waited for you and I'm going to wait for them. May you wait for him with patience. And may we cultivate patience in our hearts with one another this Advent season and forever.